Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my first trip to Jersey as well, um, and I will be back because I've seen nothing of it having arrived last night and then spent a great day in here, actually, but um, I, I certainly will be back. Um, so I want to do something slightly different. Um, uh, I want to talk about how, uh, to Dave's point, um, we're looking at Lloyd's at how we build a cognitive bank. Um, you heard Nick earlier talk about cognitive services, um, so we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, but specifically about how, uh, at the heart of that cognitive bank, um, is a strategy around pairing smart machines with smart people, so we'll get into that as well. Um, so, um, before I do give you some examples about some of the work that we're doing, I think it's important to have context about um, why we're doing this. Um, and so I won't read that, I'll let you read it. Um, but I think um, what's important to understand is that all the technology that you're hearing about today, the crypto uh, stuff that we talked about this morning, uh, the stuff that I'm going to talk about now, um, it's actually driving what people talk about as, as being the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and the previous revolution was all about bringing digital to the masses. Um, this one's a little bit different because the technology that I'm going to talk about for the next 20 minutes or so um, actually is fundamentally changing uh, and fusing the physical, uh, the digital, and, and, and bio biological worlds together. And, and in many cases, is actually challenging um, ideas about what it actually means to, to, to be human. Um, and if any of you are interested in this space, um, look up a guy called uh, Andrew Ng. Who, Andrew's uh, a data scientist out of Stanford and uh, was, used to be the chief data scientist for um, Baidu, who are effectively the Chinese Google. Um, and he has gone on record as saying that he believes that um, AI will have as transformative an impact on every single industry as electricity did. So um, if you believe that to be the case, um, then go and read some of Andrew's stuff. Um, but I think the point that um, is really important for us as a bank is that um, if we don't uh, adopt and start to use this technology to make a difference, um, somebody else will. Uh, and we can't afford to let that happen. So somebody else will use it to our disadvantage, and we can't afford to let that happen. So. Um, I'm going to go slightly off piste a bit um, and use uh, kind of a quote from one of my favorite films. This is a, film from the, uh, a quote from The Matrix. Um, and you'll see this theme go throughout the presentation, so hold on to it. Um, I'll read it out to you. So uh, Morpheus says to um, um, uh, Keanu Reeves in The Matrix, he says, um, no one can be told what The Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in bed and believe whatever you want to. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. The context of that is that um, he's asking um, the character that Keanu Reeves plays to make a choice. Um, and as a bank, um, with all this technology, we're at a point where we have had to make a choice. Um, and so um, we have made a choice. I'm going to talk to you about how we have made our choices, hopefully, by the end of the presentation, you might have some information and some ideas about whether you're going to go and take the red pill or whether you're going to take the blue pill. So um, <clears throat> there are two things uh, that I think we need to do now that we've made our choice. And one of those things is to think differently, um, and the other is to act differently. And we're going to talk about both those things in a little bit more detail. Um, so, so at Lloyd's, uh, in order to think and act differently, we've created um, what's called a machine intelligence program. Um, and that, it's deliberately a program because um, it's created as an accelerator within the bank. Um, and our job within the machine intelligence program where, where me and my team sit is to co-create the bank of the future by combining human uh, and machine intelligence with data to fundamentally change the way that we do business, creating opportunities for ourselves and for our customers. Um, and so that's uh, our reason to be. Um, and it's really important that you, uh, when you start to use this kind of technology, you have a vision and a mission statement, because otherwise you're just using technology for technology's sake. So this kind of anchors us and allows us to make sure that what we're doing is the right thing for both the bank and for the customers. 
And within the applied science group, um, we're creating specialist capability around data science, machine learning, engineering, cognitive training, and robotic process automation. You've heard about some of those things today already. Um, with a focus in four areas that I am going to give you some examples on. So clearly the focus on new technologies, um, using those to unleash new opportunities, but we have to deliver them in a new way. And, and the reason for that is that whilst we're uh, still building software, um, uh, these um, particular technologies require a different way to be delivered. Um, and uh, again, we can talk about that uh, as we go through, and we can talk about that in the panel. Um, and, and all of that, we have to power with new skills, um, which in itself is a challenge. So uh, I mentioned the four technologies that we're focused on, uh, robotic automation, um, virtual assistant technology, um, intelligent products, and uh, machine learning. Um, the great thing for you and for us is that the future's already here. This technology is already here. Thanks to the massive amounts of computational power, uh, the massive amounts of data, um, the, <coughs> the fact that um, uh, you've got as much processing power in your mobile phone as you had um, in uh, an IBM computer 20 years ago. All of that's here and, uh, and is ready. Um, and um, we can use all of that capability um, to extend human capability. So it's important at Lloyd's that we talk about pairing smart machines with smart people because we are not talking about replacing people. These machines will not take over the world in our lifetime, and I don't think they'll take over the world in the lifetime of my children either. Um, and so we want to use the technology as a way of extending human capability, um, uh, allowing people to do much more than they ever could. Um, and, and somebody earlier mentioned, I think it was Nick mentioned, um, the first step to that is to, is to remove some of the mundane process. Um, that just frees people up to do, to, to do much more and have richer conversations with our customers and richer conversations with each other. Um, All of that is really important to Lloyd's because we're in a massively competitive environment. So um, if you know anything about the UK banking market, you will know that there are a number of uh, what people call neobanks, challenger banks. So you've got um, your Monzos, your Starlings, your Tandems, um, and there's lots of others. RBS are creating their own challenger bank. Um, I hear on the grapevine that HSBC are doing the same. Um, so um, customers have so much more choice. And <coughs> in the past, um, digital services have allowed us to create a 10% uplift, um, but that's not good enough anymore. So, so a 10% improvement um, just isn't good enough. There's a, a phrase called moonshot product management, which was coined by Larry Page at Google. And he says that you have to think big, because in such a competitive market, 10% just isn't enough. Okay? You have to aim for 10x. And so we believe that by combining those technologies that I spoke about together, we call it daisy chaining. Um, I'll give you some examples of that in a minute. Um, you can start to dream big, um, and you can start to think 10x, not 10%. Is um, anybody here sad like me and enjoys playing chess? OK, one or two saddos. Um, there's a, a, a guy, famous guy called Gary Kasparov, uh, who those of you who play chess will know, Grandmaster. Um, and uh, back in 1997, he was actually beaten by a machine um, built by IBM, which nobody ever thought was possible. Um, and if you read Gary's book, he talks about um, how it really sent, for, when, when it happened, um, he wanted to give up chess completely because he thought that was it. Um, and then in conversation with IBM, he realized that actually the power of what he knew about chess and the computational power of the machine together uh, could provide something much more powerful. So he talks about don't fear smart and intelligent machines, uh, embrace them and think big. And that's what we're trying to do at Lloyd's. We're trying to think 10x, not 10%. Um, <clears throat> so all of this stuff, we talked about unleashing new opportunities for us. Um, smart machines that extend human capability by sensing, abstracting, learning, and reasoning, allowing people to do so much more. And I've got some examples uh, that are uh, actually happening in the wild so, um, to, to bring it to life. So 
The first is around what we call intelligent automation. So um, it's using a combination of AI and robotics to reduce cost and improve speed and efficiency of repetitive tasks. Um, <coughs> that's immensely important to the bank because um, a lot of our cost is through process. Um, but actually, um, it's what upsets our customers the most. Why does something so simple take so long? Um, so we're using intelligent automation to be able to um, speed some of those things up. Here's a really good example. Um, so most of you will have probably had that really ir irritating phone call about PPI. Um, and, and, and we employ hundreds upon hundreds of people to deal with PPI claims. Um, I won't walk you through the process, but the top bit is um, what happens before, and the bottom bit is what happens now. And we've used a combination of technologies from uh, our strategic partners, Google, IBM, uh, and an RPA company called Blue Prism. Um, and we've daisy-chained them together in order to be able to completely reimagine and redesign the process, fully automated. Um, enhanced judgment. So uh, using AI capability in support of human intelligence to increase insights. Back to the point about we're not replacing human intelligence. We're actually supporting human intelligence to enable growth. Um, we're using human intelligence and machine intelligence to make better decisions. Um, so just some really simple examples of that are um, Lloyd is one of the UK's biggest digital franchises, but we also have one of the biggest um, contact centers in the UK um, because people still want to phone us, people still do phone us. Um, and it could be extremely difficult for us to create efficiencies across that network because it's hard for us to plan and forecast when we need people to answer the phones. So we can use this kind of technology to be able to um, plan and forecast um, so that we've got the right people in the right places at the right time to provide the right customer experience. Um, another really good example is um, uh, using uh, machine learning and the data to deliver insights to customers. So Diane just talked about um, nudges um, those nudges are all powered by um, data and uh, machine learning that then gives you information that you can make a better and more informed decision on. And those are just a couple of examples of what we talk about when we talk about enhanced judgment. Um, this is a world that I'm really close to. I've got a couple of teams working on what we call smart interactions. So effectively, this is um, having a virtual assistant um, that you as a customer can talk to whenever you want to talk to it. So we use again. We're using the technology to support human intelligence to improve the customer experience and to provide that personalised service that, as Diana said, customers like us are starting to want. Um, at the same time, we're also improving it for our colleagues who are serving those customers um, by giving them insights at the right time. Um, and it means that we can we can we can help millions of customers um, much quicker, much more efficiently, and with a better level of customer service than we ever could. Um, the technology itself is important, but actually there's, you know, Dave invited me here. He said, I'd like you to come and just talk to a few friends of mine in, 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 in Jersey. So bear in mind that you're all friends. I'll let you into a, into a secret. Um, uh, and that's the, uh, there's this thing called messaging that we're all, um, it's all starting to become second nature to us. So I'm pretty sure that before you picked up your phone to call somebody this morning, um, you sent somebody a message. Um, and that's because messaging is starting to become our preferred way to communicate with each other. Um, and it very soon is going to be the preferred way to communicate with services like banks, utilities, uh, and any other service industry. And so if you combine what is a relatively simple concept of conversational user interfaces, as we call them, uh, messaging, um, and you combine that with AI and the human, um, then you really are starting to create what we call um, the digital future. Um, and the messaging bit is, uh, is so important because um, we've created effectively a new channel for our customers that didn't exist. Um, it now exists. They can talk to us on their own time. They can talk to a virtual assistant through messaging interface. Um, if they don't get their, what they want from a virtual assistant, they can talk to a person through a messaging interface. They can also talk to a person through a messaging interface in their own time. So I can start a conversation with the bank 
um, either with a virtual assistant or with a person, um, I can walk to the tube station, um, I can disappear for an hour, come back, and I can still continue the conversation, okay? And I'm doing it on my time. I'm not doing it when I've got five minutes and a lunch hour and I'm off to grab a sandwich and I remembered that I need to call the bank because I need to do something. So messaging is really simple, but you combine it with AI and humans um, and you've got something really powerful. Um, <clears throat> we're using the technology to create what we call intelligent products. So um, there's been a lot of talk about APIs, we, we, we in Lloyd's, uh, certainly the team that I operate in, build what we call products or services that are all API based. Um, and the idea behind these is that you create microservices that can then be combined together to truly transform customer experiences. Um, and so a really good example um, is uh, a couple of intelligent products that we have where we are digitizing conversations. So things like speech to text, um, it's really important because um, digitizing the conversation means we can genuinely understand what people are talking to us about. It's really hard for us to currently digitize the conversation because most of it is a manual process. Um, and the conversations that we do digitize, we only digitize for compliance reasons. So literally 1% of our voice recordings um, are manually listened to and marked for compliance. But we don't get any insight out of that information, which um, it's a bit of a shame when you consider the rich amount of data that we have and we don't derive any insight. Um, and similarly, we compare that with uh, entity detection, topic extraction, um, and we can start through natural language generation to genuinely understand the intents of what people are wanting to talk to us about so that we can take action. And all of those products are built as microservices. Um, and then uh, it's really important that, that we as a bank start to recover some of the trust that was lost from the crash uh, years ago. Um, and uh, there are many ways that we can do that. Keeping people safe is one of those. And banks have been using, using machine learning for years to, to keep people safe, to spot patterns, uh, irregular payment patterns, and, and, and to flag those and to deal with them. Um, but there are other ways that we can uh, generate greater trust with our customers. So, um, I'm not sure if uh, any of you know, but there is um, a massive link between people who get into financial difficulty and mental health, um, which, when you look at it on the surface, actually makes sense. So you get into financial difficulty, you can't get out of it, you start to worry, you start to stress. That has a negative impact on your mental health. Um, we have all that information, right? Um, one of the simple descriptions that I've been told about AI is it reduces the cost of prediction. Um, and prediction is central to decision making. So if we just use AI to reduce the cost of prediction and we can predict um, that you are likely to get into financial difficulty, then we can talk to you about it through the messaging channel or through other channels that we have um, and we can do something about it before it happens. Um, and so using the technology to do things like that creates greater trust with our customers. So um, all of that has to be delivered in a new way, as I spoke about. So um, you know, the, the applied science uh, is a center of excellence. Um, the idea is that it won't be part of the group in three years' time, because uh, the group will just be doing this stuff um, naturally. Um, we're uh, a pretty agile bank in the sense that um, we operate on agile principles. Um, we build a lot of infrastructure capability, some of it in the cloud, some of it on-prem. Um, but you can't operate machine learning models in the same way that you support and maintain uh, software. It just doesn't work like that. So you have to think differently about uh, how you're building these things, what your operating model is, um, how you're going to support, maintain, and operate these algorithms that you're putting into the bank. Um, and then finally, and actually, Probably most importantly, we need to find new skills. Um, there is a massive shortage of skills, uh, of, of skills to do this kind of work, not just in the UK, but actually um, worldwide. Um, largely because the people that are doing this stuff are actually, uh, a big chunk of them are still at universities doing computer science degrees. Um, and so um, a skill shortage is a real problem for us. So um, one of the things that we have done is rely on some of our partners. So if you're thinking about getting started in this space, one of the things I would re highly recommend you do 
is you go and talk to some of the big boys who can help you um, in terms of providing you with those skills to get you started. Um, you know, there isn't a big pool of data scientists in the UK. Data engineering's a relatively new trade. Um, conversation designers, um, there are very few of those, and they're mainly in the movie and, and, and gaming industry. So you have to think differently, you have to act differently, um, and it means you need new skills in order to deploy some of this stuff. And then, finally, um, back to um, the matrix. Um, we've made our choice, and hopefully some of the things that I've spoken to you about today will help you make your choice. So thank you for listening, um, and I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>